We're, we're not doing 2 Timothy tonight, but this would be a good lead-in passage. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. All right. Cardinal Wiseman, Roman Catholic, 1800s. He died in 1862, if I remember right. Uh, he was the editor of the Vatican Manuscript. He had a great influence on some men that we've talked about. Spelled that wrong. John Newman and Edward Pousset in England. John Newman took it upon himself to move the schools, the secular and uh, ministerial schools in England, away from the fundamental truths of the Christian faith and back under the influence of the Roman Catholic Church. Edward Pousset set about to do that in the churches themselves. He sought to influence the ministers of the churches, move them away from fundamental Bible doctrine back to the Roman Catholic religion. These two men were two of the five leaders of what was known as the Oxford Movement. This movement lasted from 1833 to 1845. They printed and distributed tracts and pamphlets throughout England, seeking to influence the educational system and the religious system of the nation and move them away from the Church of England and back under the wing of the Pope and the Vatican. As a reward, or, or, or when the movement ran its course, Newman surrendered his uh, office as priest in the Church of England and joined the Roman Catholic Church that took place in 1845 for his work and his labor in turning uh, the English churches and the English universities away from Bible truth and back to Roman Catholicism. The Pope made Newman a cardinal in the Roman Catholic system. Uh, James uh, Seitler, his, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Seitler's son, uh, Abby Logan, is, this is his daddy, written a tremendous book on, on the influence of, of uh, Wiseman, Newman, and these men upon uh, Christianity in the United States. But uh, listen to this information from him. Uh, John Henry Newman, in the early 1840s, wrote a series of pamphlets entitled Tracts for the Times, from which the name of the ritualist Romanizing movement was derived. They called this the Tractarian movement as well as the Oxford movement. He argued that the Church of England should adopt Roman Catholic liturgical practices, such as burning incense, using candles, and brightly colored vestments, reading the service uh, with the back to the congregation like they did in the Roman church, and so on. The Tractarian movement had a tremendous influence on the Church of England and on English culture in general. In 1830, when Newman began his work, there were 434 Roman Catholic priests in England. By 1860, there were 1,242 Roman Catholic priests in England. In 1830, there were 16 convents training uh, nuns. In 1860, there were 162 convents in England. In 1844, there were 2,054 Roman uh, churches tending toward Romanism. By 1898, there were 7,044. Newman was made a cardinal in 1847 after formally going over to Rome in 1845. Uh, he uh, wrote from Rome to Cardinal Wiseman in Ireland proposing a new translation sanctioned by the Pope based on the Latin Vulgate to be published and distributed in England. An article in the Edinburgh Review in October 1853 entitled Church Parties estimated uh, from a sample of 500 ministers at that time that uh, 18,000 in the Church of England were high church, 6,500 low church, 3,500 were broad church. The high church party were those that adhered to Newman's teachings. Uh, the... Uh, uh, low church was evangelical, which there were uh, about 2,500. Uh, 2,500 of these were recordite, which means they followed a periodical known as the record, which was very orthodox indeed. The broad church was markedly liberal. So when Newman finished his course pretending to be Church of England, when he was representing the Roman Catholic Church, when he finished his course of the... Uh, 
16 to 17,000 churches in England, only 2,500 were still fundamental and conservative in their Christian doctrine. Now, isn't it amazing the influence that just a few men can have on a nation? God help us, God help us to find a few men who are right to have that kind of influence on, on our nation, on our people. The Bible says in Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 1, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. Verse number 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. What's the solution? Verse 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, Truly furnished unto all good works. The only antidote for evil men is to continue in the Word of God. The only antidote for, for seducers is to continue in the Word of God. The only way to keep from being swept up in an apostate movement is to stay true to the fundamental truths that have been set forth by ages and generations that have come before us. You cannot deny that the reference here is to inspired Scripture. And you cannot deny that the reference here is calling upon men to be perfect. How could you possibly be perfect if the Scripture that is giving you doctrine and reproof and correction and instruction is less than perfect. So the call in 2 Timothy 3 is to watch out for evil men and seducers. Watch out for these men when perilous times come. And the only way to keep them from influencing you is to stay with the inspired, infallible preserved scriptures of your fathers and your forefathers. Now, in the United States, and we'll talk about these men uh, another time, Trench and Hodge uh, led the movement away from, from the Word of God. But in, uh, in England, the men were Westcott and Hort. Westcott and Hort were disciples of Newman. They were products of the Oxford movement, of the Tractarian movement. And they ended up heading the revision committee that gave you in, uh, in, uh, in place of the King James Bible a translation based upon the Vatican manuscript which had been edited by Cardinal Wiseman. These men, Westcott and Hort, produced a Bible that was true to the Roman Catholic religion and offered that Bible to the people of England in place of the authorized King James Version. Let's find out who these men were and some of what they believed. Uh, Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort are two men that you must know something about. Uh, these two men were more uh, anti-biblical than their, uh, the men that came before them, such as uh, Tischendorf and these fellows. Uh, Westcott did not believe in creation. He said that Genesis 1 to 3 should not be taken literally, and he accepted and embraced Darwin's book on origin of species and believed that, uh, that uh, faith in God and a rejection of creation and an acceptance of the theory of evolution were compatible. Secondly, he did not believe that the Bible was historically true. He thought that Moses and David were poetic characters who never existed as real people. 
Uh, Westcott uh, wrote uh, in, uh, this is from uh, The Life and Letters of uh, Brooke Foss Westcott, Volume 2, page 69, quote, No one now, I suppose, holds that the first three chapters of Genesis give a literal history. I do. I, I hold that. I could never understand how anyone reading them with open eyes could think they did. So it is probably elsewhere. Are we not going through a trial in regard to the use of popular language on literary subjects like that through which we went, not without sad losses in regard to the use of popular language on physical subjects? If you feel now that it was to speak humanly necessary that the Lord should speak of the sun rising... It was no less necessary that he would use the names Moses and David as his contemporaries used them. There was no critical question at issue. Poetry, I think, is a thousand times more true than history. This is a private parenthesis for myself alone. Westcott also said that David is not a chronological but a spiritual person. So, he didn't even believe that the men whose history is recorded in the Bible ever lived. He believed the Bible was a collection of, of fairy tales that taught moral lessons. Thirdly, he did not believe in the biblical account of miracles. Westcott said, quote, I never read an account of a miracle, but I seem instinctively to feel its improbability and discover somewhat of evidence in the account of it. Now, why would you embrace, why would you accept a Bible like the Revised Version or the American Standard Version or the New International Version or the New World Translation that is the result of the so-called biblical scholarship of a man like this? Number four, he did not believe in the literal physical second coming of Jesus Christ. He wrote, these are his words, quote, As far as I can remember, I said very shortly what I hold to be the Lord's coming in my little book on the historic faith. I hold very strongly that the fall of Jerusalem was the coming which first fulfilled the Lord's words. And as there have been other comings, I cannot doubt that He is coming to us now. So, what, what uh, Westcott believed was that the second coming of Jesus Christ or the coming of Jesus Christ was any event which had a spiritual implication or a spiritual impact upon somebody's life, that was the coming again or the second coming of Christ. That's pretty sad, isn't it? He didn't believe that heaven was a literal place. Hort said, and again I quote him, no doubt the language of the rubric is unguarded, but it saves us from the error of connecting the presence of Christ's glorified humanity with place. Heaven is a state and not a place. You've heard America's most famous evangelist adopt that position in the last ten years. He goes on to say, quote, Yet the unseen is the largest part of life. Heaven lies about us now in infancy alone, but by swift, silent pauses for thought, for recollection, for aspiration, we can not only keep fresh the influence of that uh, diviner atmosphere, but breathe it more habitually. In other words, Westcott thought, thought that heaven was a, a moment to sit down and have a cup of coffee in the middle of a busy day. Well, that's really something to get excited about, isn't it? Here I thought it was streets of gold and walls of jasper and gates of pearls and uh, singing round about the throne of the Lord forever. I thought it was going to be a new body, no sickness, sorrow, pain, or death. And now I find out it's just a breath of fresh air on a cool morning. Now, you know, why not just call yourself a, a pagan? I got more respect for a North American native who worships nature than I do for a man who calls himself a Christian and a biblical scholar who doesn't believe anything in the Bible. That's Westcott. Uh, he, uh, 
was, uh, was a Newmanist, as we said. He was a follower of Newman. Uh, in uh, 1852, he wrote this regarding the woman that he would marry. Quote, Today I have again taken up Tracts for the Times by Dr. Newman. Don't tell me that he will do me harm. At least today he will. He, was, he has done me good. And had you been here, I should have asked you to read his solemn words to me. My purchase has already amply repaid me. I think I shall choose a volume for one of my Christmas companions. So he said, I read Newman, and Newman didn't do me harm, he did me good. Well, Newman wrote, Newman's pamphlets said the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith are not true and not to believe. The Bible isn't true and isn't to be believed. And the best thing we can do is go back to Rome and bow down at the feet of the Pope. Westcott said, man, it did me good to hear that. That's the guy that gave you the RSV. This was after Newman had defected to Rome. Westcott found spiritual uh, balm in the words of a Roman Catholic defector, an infidel. Uh, Benjamin Wilkerson in his book says, uh, quote, by voice and by uh, pen... The teaching of Newman changed in the minds of many their attitude toward the Bible. Uh, allegorizing of theology, the influence of Newman, the leaders of the movement were, as origin of old, allegorizers. Newman contended that God never intended the Bible to teach doctrines. All right, now what's your warning? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. If you do away with your belief in an inspired Scripture, then why would you go to the Scripture for doctrine? Why would you not instead go to Christ's vicar on earth sitting at Rome to get your doctrine? Westcott bought that. He he accepted that line of notion. Um. So that's, that's Mr. Westcott. He was also a socialist, a devout socialist and a post-millennialist. He believed that if you could just take all the money from working people that they had earned and give it to non-working people, if you could take the wealth from the rich and re- redistribute it and give it to the poor, if everybody had the same amount of money and the same size piece of land and wore the same color shirt, that you would have the kingdom of God on earth, the kingdom of heaven on earth, and that if things ever got that good, uh, Christ might show up and add His blessing to it. That's Westcott. Now, isn't it amazing that America for hundreds of years with a King James Bible believed in, in a work ethic, And since we replaced the King James Bible with the modern versions, we now have a gimme ethic. It all it all ties in. Westcott was a peace activist. Um, He founded in 1889 the Christian Social Union, which was an organization that, like the United Nations, failed to ever bring peace to one square foot of uh, planet Earth. He was also a devout pacifist. He um, was a social reformer. His son wrote this regarding him. As a boy, my father took keen interest in social movement. The effect then produced upon his youthful imagination by the popular presentation of the sufferings of the masses never faded. His diary shows how he deserted his meals to be present at various stirring scenes, and in particular to listen to oratory of the great agitator uh, O'Connor himself. He would often in later years speak of these early impressions, which served in no small degree to keep alive his intense hatred of every form of injustice and oppression. He later uh, disapproved of his father's fishing excursions because it was cruel to the fish. Well, he's way ahead of his time. On one occasion, being a little boy, he was carrying a fish basket when his father put a live fish into it. And late in life, he used to declare that he could still feel the anguish of that fish. If he'd have fried it, it would have quit flopping. Um, 
Um, he was a fervent believer in socialism, as we said. Uh, from his letters, quote, the French re- Revolution has been a great object of interest. I confess to strong sympathy uh, with its leaders. They have been distinguished by great zeal and sincerity. Uh, Lamartine, who I fancy you know by name, uh, wins my admiration. So, that's Westcott. Now, how about his Romanism? He heard a sermon once condemning the adoration and worship of the Pope. And he said, as for Mr. Oldham's meetings, that's the preacher who preached against the papacy, I think they are not good in their tendency. Nothing can be so bad as making them the vehicle of controversy. What an exquisitely beautiful verse is that of Keeble's and yearns not her parental heart, etc. We seem now to have lost all sense of, of pity. Should not our arm against Rome be prayer and not speeches, the efforts of our inmost heart, and not the display of secular reason. Uh, The King James Bible translators referred to the Pope as the father of all iniquities and the church at Rome as the great whore of revelation. So they weren't quite, quite eye to eye on their view of of Rome. Now, uh, Mr. Westcott's Romanism can be seen in the fact that he, number one, believed in baptismal regeneration. He said that we have no right to exclaim against the idea of the commencement of a spiritual life conditioned from baptism any more than we have to deny the commencement of a moral life from birth. That's Hort. He believed in baptismal regeneration. Prayers for the dead. He said, quote, I considered very carefully in conference with some other bishops of large knowledge and experience the attitude of our church with regard to prayers for the dead. We agreed unanimously that we are, as things are now, forbidden to pray for the dead apart from the whole church and our public services, but no restriction is placed upon private devotions. He encouraged praying for the dead. You know, if the Bible's true, if you died in Christ, you're in heaven, and you don't need to be prayed for. And If you died without knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're burning in hell, and if we all prayed for you for the next million years, you couldn't get out. So, whether it's forbidden or not, doesn't make any difference. Uh, it's pointless to pray for the dead. You choose your eternal destiny in this life. Uh, Westcott also believed in purgatory. The Bible says, in my father's house are many mansions. The revised version of Westcott says, in my father's house are many abiding places. You'll find some variation of that in all the modern Bibles. Uh, Westcott and the revision committee referred, said, uh, said of this passage, it referred not to a final future state, but to intermediate stations in the future before the final one. In Westcott's commentary on John's Gospel, he gives the following explanation. In my father's house are many mansions. The rendering comes from the Vulgate Manchones, which were resting places, and especially the stations on the great road where travelers found refreshment. This appears to be the true meaning of the Greek word here, so the contrasted notions of repose and progress are combined in a vision of the future. So he thought the, the place in Matthew 14 that Jesus went to prepare was a stopping off place on your road to wherever you might be going. I don't believe that for a minute. Certainly not what the Bible taught. Westcott was also a communist and was a supporter of the communist movement of his day. I could quote you some long passages from his writings to support that, but we'll, we'll not do that this evening as that's more uh, political than spiritual, but it certainly uh, shows you uh, his character and his understanding with regard to spiritual matters. 
His most troubling position was on Mary. He wrote a letter to his fiancée, Sarah Wittard, and he said, after visiting, he wrote her letter after he visited a monastery. And he says, quote, After leaving the monastery, we shaped our course to a little oratory which we discovered on the summit of a neighboring hill. Fortunately, we found the door open. It is very small with one kneeling place, and behind a screen was a statue of the Virgin, the size of life, a virgin holding a dead Christ. Now, he didn't write all that out. He said it was a paeta, P-I-E-T-A, but that's, that's what that is. That's, a, that's the virgin holding, holding the dead Jesus. Had I been alone, I could have knelt there for hours. Had I been alone, I could have taken a hammer to the thing. That's two, two different views. Westcott's affection for Mary is also indicated by his son Arthur. He's writing to describe his father's reaction to the painting the Sistine Madonna. Quote, it is smaller than I expected. The coloring is less rich, but in expression it is perfect. The face of the Virgin is unspeakably, unspeakably beautiful. I look to the lips, seem to tremble with intensity of feeling. A feeling simply, for it would be impossible to say whether it be awe or joy or hope. Humanity shrinking before the divine or swelling with its conscious possession. It is enough that there is deep, intensely deep emotion such as the mother of the Lord may have had. And then uh, Westcott said, My mother whose name was, uh, this is son, my mother whose name is, uh, was Sarah Wattard was the eldest of three sisters. She afterward at the time of her confirmation at my father's request took the name of Mary in addition to her given names. So here's a man who doesn't believe Genesis is literal. He doesn't believe the historical people in the Bible are literal. He doesn't believe heaven is literal. He doesn't believe hell is literal. He doesn't believe the second coming is literal. And he could spend hours kneeling before a statue of the Virgin Mary holding the dead Christ. And you're going to tell me that the NIV is more to be trusted than the King James when Westcott is one of the two men that used the Vatican manuscript to produce it? No wonder it watered down and removed the verses on hell. It's no wonder. Well, let's see who else we got. Mr. Hort was probably not as far gone as as Westcott. But he had his share of problems. I'm trying not to read you all of this because it's just, just such a deep ditch. Right, let me give you a couple more things about Westcott here. His prejudice against the Textus Receptus was, was tremendous. Neither of them obviously were Bible believers, Westcott or Hort. They were both known to have resented the preeminence given to the authorized version. In its underlying Greek text, they believed the Roman manuscripts, Vaticanus and Aleph, were better simply because they were older. They believed this even though Hort admitted that the received text was equal in antiquity to the old Egyptian manuscripts which they used. But uh, Hort said, and I'm quoting, quoting from his letters, The Life and Letters of Fenton John Anthony Hort, published in New York in 1896. Quote, I had no idea till the last few weeks of the importance of the text, having read so little of the Greek text, testament, and dragged on with the villainous Textus Receptus. Think of the vile Textus Receptus. It is a blessing there are such early manuscripts. So he referred to the foundation of your King James Bible as villainous and vile. Uh, Hort had occasion to consider the uh, proper readings on passages uh, such as those omitted from Mark's Gospel, uh, but uh, chose to ignore them. Hort said, for ourselves, we dare not introduce considerations which could not reasonably be applied to other ancient texts, supposing them to have uh, documentary attestation of equal amount, variety, and antiquity. 
in the New Testament as in almost all prose writings which have been much copied, corruptions by interpolation are many times more numerous than corruptions by omission. So it was the position of Hort that the New Testament was just another example of prose writing that had uh, had been uh, corrupted through transmission down through the years. He said, I am inclined to think that no such place as Eden ever existed and that Adam's fall in no degree differs from the fall of each of his descendants. And he found that the writings of Samuel Coolridge were more to be trusted with regard to the origins of man than were the book of Genesis. That's one of the men that gave you the revised version. Hort said, quote, I agree with the authors of essays and reviews. That's John Newman. In condemning many leading specific doctrines of the popular theology, evangelicals seem to me perverted rather than untrue. There are, I fear, still more serious differences between us on the subject of authority especially the authority of the Bible. Okay? So, if you're a fundamentalist, if you hold to the historic positions of the, of the Christian faith based on the Bible and your authority for what you believe is the Bible, Hort said, you're not so much untrue, you're just perverted. Now, what do you think you're going to get when a man like that puts out a version of the Bible? or translation of the Bible. He also stated, As I was writing the last words, a note came from Westcott. He too mentions having had fears, which he now pronounces groundless, on the strength of our last conversation, in which he discovered that I did not recognize providence in biblical writings. Most strongly I recognize it, but I am not prepared to say that it necessarily involves infallibility. So I still await judgment. He said, God may have had something to do with the writing of the Bible. He maybe he didn't. I'm not sure. But one thing I am sure of, the Bible's not infallible. I don't want a revised version. I don't want an American Standard version. I don't want a good news for modern man. I don't want anything that came from those guys. Don't want it. Hort said in writing to his colleague Westcott, quote, Have you ever read Darwin? How I should like to talk with you about it. In spite of difficulties, I am inclined to think it unanswerable. In any case, it is a treat to read such a book. In writing to his friend John Ellerton, quote, The book which has most engaged me is Darwin. Whatever may be thought of it, it is a book that one is proud to be contemporary with. My feeling is strong that the theory is unanswerable. If so, it opens up a new period. Now, a man that would be proud to associate himself with Darwin, and a man that thinks the drug addict, Coolridge, was more to be trusted than Moses and Genesis, that's the man that gave you the new translations. I don't trust them. Uh, Hort was, as we mentioned, an adherent of the teachings of Coolridge. Uh, these guys are amazing. Uh, I read all that st- stuff in college. I'd take early British lit, mid-British lit, uh, later British literature. And here's what these guys do. Uh, Coolridge would go out in the morning and he'd go down downtown and he'd take a few dollars out of his pocket and buy some opium. Then he'd go back to his flat and get wasted on opium, and pass out on the floor. And when he started to wake up, he's half conscious, he'd take out a pen and a paper, and he'd start to write. There I was on the ship with the albatross around my neck. Whew, man, it was a bad trip. Then you go off to college and you read that junk, and they give you a piece of paper that says you're smart. Because you read the deluded writings of a dope addict. In Xanadu, where Kubla Khan sat in front of the flower pot and 
pictured himself on a train in a station with plasticine porters and looking glass ties and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, he says in undergraduate days, if not before, that he came under the spell of Coolridge. Coolridge was a college dropout. He was a dope addict. His opium habit began when he needed to deaden the pain of rheumatism so he could do his three-hour radio talk show each afternoon. But uh, the pain grew stronger and it took more and more dope all the time to keep him going. After vainly trying in Malta and Italy to break away from opium, Coolidge came back to England in 1806 and decided to write poetry. Uh, His opium habit was said to have greatly hampered his creativity. His famous poems amount to about 20 pages of text. And the really great stuff, so-called, that you study in college, he only got halfway through it before he passed out. And so if you want to take an honors class, what you do is you read the half of the poem that Coolridge wrote when he was wasted, and then where he hits the floor, then you're supposed to finish it. I'm not kidding, man. I'm not, I'm not kidding. <clears throat> Unless you trust me instead of the Lord, I always got an A in those classes. <laughs> I was as nuts as he was without the dope. <laughs> How's that, man? Uh, anyway, uh, Coolridge was, uh, was, uh, Hort's influence. Now, if you want to know, if you want to know, that, that'd be like a guy today saying, well, you know, when, when I, when I want to prepare a sermon, I want to get really close to God, I get alone in my room, and I put on my headset, and I listen to some Black Sabbath. And whatever, whatever God says to me, I just stare into the black light and I write my outline. You say, man, what what in the world would you listen to a guy like that for? Why in the world would you read an NIV? And those are the guys Hort Hort was following and hanging out with. Oh, don't you love Spurgeon's preaching? I don't know. It ain't much compared to Edgar Allan Poe. But that's, that's the kind of guys we're dealing with. Poe wrote that poem about his... Pet bird. He had a raven. <clears throat> Tabitha knows. You know what his raven's name was? Come on. Quoth. He's always referring to Quoth the raven. He said, uh, uh. All right. Uh, Hort, Hort writing to uh, Macmillan said, quote, you seem to make Greek philosophy worthless for those who have received Christian revelation. To me, though in a hazy way, it seems full of precious truth, of which I find nothing and should be very much astonished and perplexed to find anything in revelation. He said, I never found any truth in the revelation of of the Bible, but I did find some truth in, in Greek philosophy. Hort said, the discussion which immediately precedes These four lines naturally leads to another enigma, most intimately connected with that of everlasting penalties, namely that of the personality of the devil. It was Coolridge who some three years ago first raised any doubts in my mind on the subject, doubts which have never yet been at all set to rest one way or the other. You yourself are very cautious in your language. Now, if there be a devil, he cannot merely bear a corrupted and marred image of God. He must be wholly evil. His name is evil. His every energy and act would be evil. Would it not be a violation of the divine attributes for the word to be actively in support of such a nature as that? So Hort said, Coolridge talked me out of my belief in a literal Satan. I don't believe in that. Regarding hell, Hort said, I think Maurice's letter to me sufficiently showed that we have no sure knowledge respecting the duration of future punishment and that the word eternal has a far higher meaning than the merely material one of excessively long duration. Extinction always grates against my mind as something impossible. Certainly in my case it proceeds from no personal dread which I have been living uh, when I have been living most godlessly I have never been able to frighten myself with visions of a distant future. 
even while I once held, while I held the doctrine. So Hort said, you know, I've been living an ungodly life and I'm not afraid of hell, so I've decided there must not be one. Well, that's, that's great. So you know what you get when you pick up one of these modern versions? You get a Bible without hell in it. Why? Why is there no hell in a New World Translation? Because it's a child of Westcott and Hort. And Westcott and Hort didn't believe in hell. So the best manuscripts, they lied to you when they told you that. 95% of the manuscripts had hell in them, but Hort didn't believe in hell. So out it went. How about purgatory? Well, he wrote a letter to John Ellerton, 1854, said, I agree with you in thinking it a pity that Maurice verbally repudiates purgatory, but I fully and unwaveringly agree with him in three cardinal points of the controversy. Number one, that eternity is independent of duration. Number two, that the power of repentance is not limited to this life. Number three, that it is not revealed whether or not all will ultimately repent. The modern denial of the second, as I suppose, more to do with the despiritualizing of theology than almost anything that could be named. He said, I'm not sure you don't get a second chance to repent after you die. And since I think you might get a second chance to repent after you die, then purgatory must be there because I need a purgatory to fit in with my idea. Hort also said, the idea of purgation, of cleansing as by fire, seems to me inseparable from what the Bible teaches us of the divine chastisements. And though little is directly said respecting the future state, it seems to me incredible that the divine chastisements should in this respect change their character when this visible life is ended. I do not hold it contradictory to think that the condemned doctrine has not been wholly injurious inasmuch as it has kept alive some sort of belief in a great and important truth. So, these two men did not believe. They did not believe in creation. They did not believe in hell. They did not believe in heaven. They did not believe in the devil. They did not believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. They did not believe in the inspiration of Scripture. And you want a Bible produced by these men because somebody said they were scholars? How silly is that? Hort's view of the atonement. Quote, The fact is, I do not see how God's justice can be satisfied without every man suffering in his own person the full penalty for his sins. He flat out denied the blood atonement of Jesus Christ for your sins. He said, I just don't believe there's any way a man can avoid paying for his own sins. You know what that means? That means if you've got a revised version, you've got a book produced by a man that was not saved. I don't care what you think about the theology or the, or the church affiliation of the men that gave you the King James Bible, at least they trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Or if one of them by chance didn't, he knew who the Savior was. Hort said, you ready for this? Certainly, nothing can be more unscriptural than the modern limiting of Christ bearing our sins and sufferings to His death. But indeed, that is only one aspect of an almost universal heresy. You know why why redemption through His blood is not in the modern Bibles? Because Hort didn't believe you got redemption through His blood. He thought that was a heresy. Listen to this. This is Hort. Quote, I confess I have no repugnance to the primitive doctrine of a ransom paid to Satan, 
though neither am I prepared to give full assent to it, but I can see no other possible form in which the doctrine of a ransom is at all tenable, anything is better than the notion of a ransom paid to the Father. He said if Jesus died, He did it for Satan. He didn't do it for for God the Father. Hort also believed in baptismal regeneration. Quote, at the same time, in language stating that we maintain baptismal regeneration as the most important of doctrines, the pure Romish view seems to me nearer and more likely to lead to the truth than the evangelical view. Baptism assures us that we are children of God, members of Christ and His body, and heirs to the heavenly kingdom. So, Mr. Hort didn't believe in a devil, didn't believe in hell, didn't believe in heaven, didn't believe in the blood atonement, uh, didn't believe in Jesus Christ paying for your sins. But just in case there might be a heaven, just in case there might be a hell, you better get baptized. So Jesus dying on the cross didn't pay for my sin, but a man throwing a handful of water in my face will pay for it. I just don't think you ought to criticize people. You in, are you in Second Timothy? You still got that? Second Timothy chapter three, verse number five. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. These are church men reading Bibles, studying Bibles, talking about God. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the saving power of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, "From such turn away." Now watch. For this sort of they which creep into houses, God called them creeps, I didn't, and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning, these were intelligent men, scholars, students, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Hey, you can ma- you can get a master's or a doctorate in eight different fields, but if you don't believe the Bible to be the Word of God, you'll never find the truth. Now, verse 8, Now, as Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. You know what the Holy Spirit did in verse 3? He named names. I just don't think we ought to, you ought to name names like that. Well, the, God did in the Bible. He named names, told you to stay away from them. Isn't that right? Verse 9, But they shall proceed no further, and their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. Now, here's what happens. If you believe the Bible, like Burgeon did in England, you go after these men and you expose them. If you believe the Bible, like the fellows we're going to talk about later here in America that oppose Trench and Hodge, you go after these men and you expose them. But if your mind has been corrupted in a school that accepts Westcott and Hort's theory, if your mind has been corrupted in a church that accepts Westcott and Hort's theory, then their their corrupt influence will proceed because there's no one to stop it. And the only way to stop it is to expose it. And anybody gets through a liberal school or a conservative school, a fundamental school or a, or a, a left-wing school, if they put a, a degree in your hand that says you have graduated from a Christian school, I don't care if it's a high school or a college, and they have not told you what Westcott and Hort believe, and that those two men are responsible for the modern versions, you ought to demand every penny you paid to that school return to you. Hey, I don't, I don't care if you go to Florida State and, and get a degree in auto repair. In four years of school, somebody ought to tell you what the men who are responsible for destroying the educational condition of our nation and the spiritual condition of our nation, they ought to tell you what they believed.
Don't tell me about Westcott and Hort's scholarship and how they use the Vatican manuscript and the older text to restore it. Never mind that. Tell me what they believed. And then I'll know why hell's not in that Bible. And then I'll know why the blood atonement's not in that Bible. And then I'll know why the deity of Christ is not in that Bible. If, if you just tell me what the belief system was of the men that gave me that book, I wouldn't have any trouble at all knowing which Bible to purchase at the Christian bookstore. Now, here's an amazing thing. On the shelf at the Christian bookstore are books warning you about the occult and the New Age movement. And on the next shelf is a book of apologetics telling you how to defend the fundamentals of the faith. And on the next shelf is an NIV and a New American Standard Version. You know why they're there? Because the guy running the bookstore has never been told what Westcott and Hort believed. What Westcott and Hort believed is what the books you're selling speaks against. But you're trying to get somebody with a Westcott and Hort Bible to take a stand against a New Age movement and a liberal theology, and it can't happen. How can you do it? How can you stand against the satanic influence in a church when the greatest satanic influence is the perverted translation that church is using? Hort. Quote. Westcott. Gorham. C.B. Scott. Benson. Bradshaw. Lord. Etc. And I have started a society for the investigation of ghosts and all supernatural appearances and effects, being all disposed to believe that such things really exist and ought to be discriminated from hoaxes and mere subjective delusions. We shall be happy to obtain any good accounts well authenticated with names. Westcott is drawing up a schedule of questions. Cope calls us the Cock and Bull Club. Our own temporary name is the Ghostly Guild. Scully is coming by next week to give us a lecture. I added that last (laughs) sentence there. Now let me see if I got this right, Mr. Horton, Mr. Westcott. You don't believe Genesis is literal. You don't believe hell is literal. You don't believe the second coming is literal. But you're out looking for ghosts. Maybe you can get you a a vacuum cleaner, put it on your back, and meet Bill Murray at the library. (laughs) People are nuts, man. They're crazy. No, I never saw it. (laughs) Sorry. I think the NIV is better than the King James. You know why you think that? Because you just took somebody's word for it and you didn't take 15 minutes out of your life to find out if you were reading the Word of God or something produced by occultists. And the reason you didn't is because you base your life on feelings. And you feel like Reverend so-and-so is a good man and a nice man, so he must be right. And you feel like Brother James is a bad man because he, he growls when he speaks. And so just like your dog, you go through your entire life responding to tone of voice rather than what's said. Come on, it's America. The Bible says... Oh, 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 oh. Well, you know the way we feel about it. <laughs> That's it. Why do you go to that church? Oh, I feel so good when I leave. They gave me a milk bone biscuit. Like my new collar? It has a bell. (laughs) 
So they weren't looking for the second coming, but they were looking for spooks. They didn't believe in Genesis, but they believed in Darwin. They didn't believe the miracles of the Bible, but they thought Coolridge was to be trusted in matters of theology. Those are the men that gave you the modern versions of the Bible. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Pretty amazing. So, Brother James, why, why is it that somebody can go through seven years of Christian education and get a doctorate degree in theology and never be told this? Well, it's not the professor. It's not the president of the school. It's not the leaders of the denomination. You have to understand that over a hundred years ago, somebody pulled off the greatest deception of the latter days when they convinced you that that an infidel with book learning was more to be trusted than a simple country preacher with the Holy Spirit. And when you bought the lie that education equaled brains and that time spent feeding back information in a classroom equaled intelligence and that piety was a fit substitute for a relationship with God, the whole thing started to go down the drain. You know why the professors at these big universities are not going to present this truth? Because it wasn't presented to them by the men they looked up to and trusted. And they didn't present it because it wasn't presented to them by the men they looked up to and trusted. And they're not about to turn to it now because the only people that are, that are lifting up their voice about this stuff today are little nobodies and little churches like this one. And if you're so right, how come you don't have a million dollar outfit and a gigantic world? I'm just telling you. It's pride and ego now. Who are you? You don't even have a bunch of letters behind your name. Why, why would I listen to you? Why, listen, why would a man with seven years of university training and tenure on a faculty at a Bible school, why would he listen to me just because I know what I'm talking about? I don't have credentials. What does he have? Credentials. He's a <clears throat> scholar. I'm just telling you, it's where we are. And when a man's loyalty is to his school and not his God, you can't help him. Because he's not going to listen to you. He's not going to listen to you. There have been some men down through the years that have stood. God's used them. We'll tell you about them at the end of our study. We'll tell you where, their, where the books are, where the writings are. But they're small. They're just little little lights here and little lights there. Not much influence. Not accomplishing much. But we're still standing. Standing for this old book. But if you believe the historic position and doctrines of the Christian faith, you've got to stay with this Bible. Because the men, the men that gave you the new ones didn't believe it. They just did not believe it. Next time a fellow tells you his new version's better, ask him what he knows about Westcott. Ask him what he knows about Hort. If he doesn't know anything about either man, not likely you can do much for him. If he's willing to know something about either man, 
Now, once you know where these guys stood, it's awful easy to see why they produced what they produced. It becomes very, very clear. All right, let's pray. Father, we believe tonight that you created the heavens and the earth. We believe tonight that your son, Jesus Christ, wrought miracles. Father, we believe that Moses was, was a real person. We look forward to meeting him one day. We believe David was a real person. We look forward to meeting him.